Hello, and welcome to Indie the Abyss podcast. My name is Todd Decker. In this third episode on the philosophy of structure, I'd like to look at examples of structure in the field of chemistry. I'd like to see how some of the general principles of structure discussed in previous episodes apply to chemistry and to see what new general principles we can pick up from the examples of chemical structures. I'll proceed along different scales from the smallest and conceptually most fundamental components of chemical structure up to the larger multi-component chemical structures. For basic principles, I'll start with quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation, and its wave function solutions, which constitute atomic and molecular orbitals. From there, I'll look at different functional groups that occur repeatedly in molecules. And lastly, I'll look at the multiple levels of structure of proteins, the embedding of chemical structures, and the use of repeatable units in the formation of multi-component chemical structures. One aspect from previous discussions that won't really show up in chemistry is an aesthetic dimension of structure. That's not to say that chemical structures lack beauty. I find them quite beautiful, and the study and application of chemical structures has actually been the primary subject of my academic and professional work. In other words, I probably find chemistry more aesthetically satisfying than most people commonly would. But what I'm coming to think of as the philosophical problem of systematizing the aesthetic dimension of structure in fields like music, art, and literature isn't so directly applicable here. I'll get back to that problem in future episodes. The aesthetic dimension is not so intrinsic to the nature of the subject in the case of chemistry. So let's start getting into chemical structures by looking at the smallest and most conceptually fundamental scale. Matter waves. There is, interestingly enough, an intriguing point of commonality between music and chemistry at the most fundamental level, and that is in the importance of waveforms. Recall that the fundamental building block of a musical composition is a sound wave, a propagation of variations in the local pressure in which parts of the air are compacted and parts of the air are rarefied. Sound waves are governed by the wave equation, a second order partial differential equation, and its solution, in which a series of multiple terms are added together in a superposition, with each individual term in that summation representing a particular harmonic or overtone. There are going to be a lot of similarities to this in the basic building of chemical structures. One of the key insights and discoveries of 20th century science was that matter also takes the form of waves. This is foundational to quantum mechanics, and it is known as the de Broglie hypothesis. This was a surprising and strange realization, but it goes a long way in explaining much of what we see in chemistry. Because a particle is a wave, it also has a wavelength. Recall that in acoustics, with mechanical waves propagating through a medium, wavelength is related to the frequency and the speed of the wave's propagation. That relation is lambda equals V divided by F, where lambda is the wavelength, F is the frequency, and V is the wave propagation velocity. With this kind of mechanical wave, the wave is not a material thing, but a process, a disturbance occurring in a material medium. But with a matter wave, the wave is the matter itself. And the wavelength of the matter wave is related to the particle's momentum, a decidedly material property. A particle's wavelength is inversely proportional to its momentum. This relation is stated in the de Broglie equation, lambda equals h divided by p, in which lambda is wavelength, h is a constant called Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules per second and p is momentum. Momentum is a product of mass and velocity, p equals m times v. Because the wavelength of a matter wave is inversely proportional to momentum, the wavelength for the matter waves of micros macroscopic particles, the kinds of objects we see and interact with in our normal experience, is going to be very, very short, so as to be completely neglig negligible. But for subatomic particles, their wavelengths are going to be comparable to the scale of the atom itself, which will make their wave nature very significant to their behavior. One interesting consequence of the wave nature of matter is that the precision of simultaneous values for momentum and position of a matter wave is limited. This is known as the uncertainty principle. There's actually a similar limit to the precise specification of both wavelength and position for waves in general, i.e. for any and all waves. But because wavelength is related to momentum in matter waves, this limitation gets applied to momentum as well. Recall that with sound waves, a musical pitch can be a superposition of multiple frequencies or wavelengths. This superposition is expressed by the multiple terms in a Fourier series, 
Any function can be approximated using a Fourier series expressed in terms of added sinusoidal oscillating waves. A function that is already sinusoidal can be matched quite easily. The Fourier series can converge on more complicated functions as well, but they will require more terms. That's important. In the case of musical pitches, the resulting functions were periodic waves that repeated endlessly. But a Fourier series can also describe pulses that are localized to specific regions. The catch is that more localized pulses confined to tighter regions require progressively more terms in the series, which means a higher number of wavelengths. Bringing this back to matter waves, these same principles apply. Under the de Broglie formula, wavelength is related to momentum. A pure sine wave that repeats endlessly has only one wavelength, but it also covers an infinite region. As a matter wave, this would be a perfect specification of momentum with no specification of precision. A highly localized pulse is confined to a small region, but requires multiple terms and wavelengths in its Fourier series. So its position is highly precise, but its momentum is much less precise. The limit of this simultaneous specification of momentum and position for matter waves is given by the equation sigma sub x times sigma sub p is greater than or equal to h divided by 4 pi, where sigma sub x is the standard deviation of position, sigma sub p is the standard deviation of momentum, and h is Planck's constant. The product of these two standard deviations has a lower limit. At this lower limit, it's only possible to decrease the standard deviation of one by increasing the standard deviation of the other, and this is a consequence of the wave nature of matter. The most important application of these wave properties and quantum mechanical principles in chemistry is with the electron. Protons and neutrons are also important particles in chemistry and significantly more, more massive than electrons, but it's with the electrons where most of the action happens. Changes to protons and electrons are the subject of nuclear chemistry, which is interesting, but not something we'll get into this time around. In non-nuclear chemical reactions, it's the electron that is being arranged into the various formations that make up chemical structures. The behavior of an electron is described by a wave function, and the wave equation is governed by the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is quite similar to the classical wave equation that governs sound waves. Recall that the classical wave equation is the second deri derivative of u with respect to x is equal to 1 over v squared times the second derivative of u with respect to t, where u is the wave displacement from the mean value, x is distance, t is time, and v is velocity. A solution to this equation can be found using, using a, a method of separation of variables. The solution u of x and t can be written as the product of a function of x and a sinusoidal function of time. We can write this solution as u of x and t is equal to psi of x times cosine of 2 pi f t, where f is the frequency of the wave in cycles per unit time, and psi of x is the spatial factor of the amplitude of u of x and t, the spatial amplitude of the wave. Substituting psi of x times cosine of 2 pi f t into the differential wave equation gives the following equation for the spatial amplitude psi of x. The second derivative of psi with respect to x plus 4 pi squared f squared divided by v, uh, v squared times psi of x equals 0. And since frequency multiplied by wavelength is equal to velocity, f times lambda equals v, we can rewrite, rewrite this in terms of wavelength lambda. The second derivative of psi with respect, respect to x plus 4 times pi squared divided by lambda squared times psi of x is equal to 0. So far, this is just applicable to waves generally. But where things get especially interesting is the application to matter waves, particularly to electrons. Recall from the de Broglie formula that lambda is equal to h divided by p in which h is a constant called Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules per second, and p is momentum. We can express the total energy of a particle in terms of momentum by the equation E equals p squared divided by 2m plus v of x, where E is the total energy, m is max at mass, and v of x is potential energy as a function of distance. Using this equation, we can also express momentum in these terms. p equals 2m 
times e minus v of x all to the one half power. And since lambda equals h over p, the differential equation becomes the second derivative of psi with respect to x plus 2m divided by h bar squared times e minus v of x times psi of x equals zero, where h bar is equal to h divided by two pi. This can also be written as minus h bar divided by two m times the second derivative of psi with respect to x plus v of x times psi of x is equal to e times psi of x. This is the Schrodinger equation. Specifically, it's the time independent Schrodinger equation. So what do we have here? There's a similar relationship between the classical wave equation, a differential equation, and its solution, u of x and t, which characterizes a mechanical wave. The Schrodinger equation is also a differential equation, and its solution, psi of x, is a wave function that characterizes a matter wave. It describes a particle of mass m moving in a potential field described by v of x. Of special interest to chemistry is the description of an electron moving in the potential field around an atomic nucleus. Let's rewrite the Schrodinger equation using a special expression called an operator. An operator is a symbol that tells you to do something to whatever follows the symbol. The operator we'll use here is called a Hamiltonian operator, which has the form h equals minus h bar squared divided by 2m times the second derivative with respect to x plus v of x, where h is the Hamiltonian operator. It corresponds to the total energy of a system, including terms for both the kinetic and potential energy. We can express the Schrodinger equation much more concisely in terms of the Hamiltonian operator in the following form. h psi of x equals e psi of x. There are some special advantages to expressing the Schrodinger equation in this form. One is that it takes the form of what is called an eigenvalue problem. An eigenvalue problem is one in which an operator is, is applied to an eigenfunction, and the result returns the same eigenfunction multiplied by some constant called an, the eigenvalue. In this case, the operator is the Hamiltonian h. The eigenfunction is the wave function psi of x, and the eigenvalue is the observable energy e. These are all useful pieces of information to have that relate to each other very nicely when expressed in this form. Orbitals. In chemistry, the wave function of electrons in atoms and molecules are called atomic or molecular orbitals. And these are also found using the Schrodinger equation. They are solutions to the Schrodinger equation. The inputs to these wave functions are coordinates for points in space. The output for these wave functions, psi, is some value whose meaning is a matter of interpretation. The prevailing interpretation is the Born rule, which gives a probabilistic interpretation. Under the Born rule, the value of psi is a probability amplitude, and the square modulus of the probability amplitude, psi squared, is, a, is called a probability density. The probability density defines for each point in space the probability of finding an electron at that point, if measured. So it has a kind of conditional operational definition. More particularly, we could say, reducing space to a single dimension x, that psi of x squared gives the probability of finding the electron between x and x plus dx. Going back to three dimensions, the wave function assigns a probability amplitude value psi and a probability density value psi squared to each point in space. Informally, we might think of regions of an orbital with the highest probability density as the regions where an electron spends most of its time. Solutions to the Schrodinger equation, electron wave functions, can be solved exactly for the hydrogen atom. Other solutions cannot be solved analytically, but can be approximated to high precision using methods like the uh, variational method and perturbation theory. And again, we call these wave functions orbitals. I won't get into the specifics of the methods for finding the exact solutions for the hydrogen atom, but I'll make some general comments. For an atom, the Cartesian XYZ coordinates for the three dimensions of space aren't so convenient, so we convert everything to spherical coordinates, r, theta, phi, in which r is a radial distance and theta and phi are angles with respect to Cartesian axes. The term for potential uh, V of r in the Hamiltonian operator will be defined by the relation between a proton and an electron. And the mass of the electron also gets plugged into the Hamiltonian.
Solving for the wave function makes use of various mathematical tools like spherical harmonics and radial wave functions. Radial wave functions in turn make use of Laguerre polynomials. Then solutions for the hydrogen atom will be expressed in terms of spherical harmonic functions and radial wave functions, with the overall wave function being a function of the variables r, theta, phi. Because the orbitals are functions of r, theta, and phi, they can be difficult to visualize and represent, but par partial representations can still give an idea of their structure. An orbital is often represented as a kind of cloud taking some kind of shape in space, a probability density cloud. The intensity of the cloud shading or color represents varying degrees of probability density. The shapes of these clouds vary by the type of orbital. Classes of orbitals include s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbitals, and f orbitals. These different kinds of orbitals are grouped by their orbital angular momentum. s orbitals are sphere-shaped nested shells. p orbitals have a kind of dumbbell shape with lobes running along x, y, and z axes. D orbitals are even more unusual with lobes running along two axes and one orbital even having a kind of donut torus shape. Although we sometimes imagine atoms as microscopic solar systems with electrons orbiting in circles around the nucleus, the structure is much more unusual with these oddly shaped probability clouds all superimposed over each other. The structure of atoms into these orbitals has important implications for the nature of the elements and their arrangements into molecules. But before getting into that, let's pause a moment to reflect on the nature of the structure discussed up to this point. Reflection on the structure of the wave function. As with a sound wave, the function for an electron wave function is a solution to a differential equation, in this case the Schrodinger equation. This wave function psi is a function of position in spherical coordinates of r, theta, and phi. This function is psi of r, theta, phi. In the most basic terms, a function is a rule that assigns elements in a set or a combination of elements from multiple sets to a single element in another set. This rule imposes additional structure on relations between these sets. So in our case, we have a set for all r values, a set for all theta values, a set for all phi values, and a set for all psi values. Prior to the imposition of structure by any function, we could combine elements from these sets in any way we like. In a four-dimensional abstract phase space or state space with axes r, theta, phi, and psi, all points are available. Any ordered quadruple r, theta, phi, psi is an option. That's because an ordered triplet r, theta, phi can be associated with any value of psi. There's no rule in place limiting which values of psi an ordered triplet r theta phi can associate with. The entire phase space is available. All states are available. But with the imposition of the function psi of r theta phi, the region of permissible states conforming to this rule is significantly smaller. An ordered triplet r theta phi can be assigned to one and only one value of psi. It's useful here to distinguish between logical possibility and physical possibility. In what sense are all ordered quadrup quadruples r, theta, phi, psi in the state space possible? Most of them are not really physically possible for the electron in an atom because they would violate the laws of physics, the laws of quantum mechanics. That's because the function, the wave function, in fact, is imposed. But in the theoretical case that it were not imposed, any ordered, ordered quadruple r, theta, phi, psi would be logically possible. There's no contradiction in such a combination, at least not until we start to develop the assumptions that lead to the Schrodinger equation and its solutions. But since the actual physical world follows physical laws, only the states satisfying the function psi of r, theta, phi are physically possible. This distinction between logical possibility and physical possibility highlights one very basic source of structure, structure that arises from physical laws. Atomic or orbitals are not man-made structures. There certainly are such things as man-made structures as well, but atomic orbitals are not an example of that. I say all this to justify including atomic or orbitals as examples of structure in the first place, since in a physical sense, they seem already there anyway, or as something that couldn't be otherwise. 
But in light of the much more vast state space of logically possible states, I think it makes sense to think of even these physically given states as highly structured when compared to the logically limitless states from which they stand apart. I'd like to make one point of clarification here, especially considering the reputation quantum mechanics has for being something especially inexact or even anti-realist. What is it that the wave function specifies at each point in space for each order triplet r theta phi? It's certainly not the position of the electron. That indeed isn't specified. But what is specified is the amplitude psi. And the square modulus of the amplitude psi squared is the probability of finding the electron at the position r theta phi. The wave function doesn't specify the electron's exact position. Does this mean that chaos reigns for the electron? The electron could, after all, be anywhere in the universe, with the exception of certain nodes. But that infinite extension of possible positions doesn't mean that chaos reigns or that the electron isn't bound by structure. The probability density of the electron's position in space is very precisely defined and governs the way the electron behaves. It's not the case that just anything goes. Certain regions of space are highly probable, and most regions of space are highly improbable. This is something of a matter of perspective, and it's a philosophical rather than scientific matter, but still just as interesting for me at least. It pertains to the kinds of properties we should expect to see in different kinds of systems. What kinds of properties should we expect quantum systems to have? What are quantum properties? Do quantum systems have definite properties? I've addressed this in another episode on the podcast, drawing on the, th on the thought of uh, Sunny Uyang. Uh, in her thought, in her view, there's an important distinction uh, to be made between classical properties and quantum properties. Even if quantum systems don't have definite classical properties, that's not to say they don't have properties at all. They just have properties of a different kind, properties that are more removed from the kinds of classical properties we interact with on a daily basis. We're used to interacting with definite positions and definite momenta at our macroscopic scale of experience. At the quantum level, such definite predicates are not found for position and momentum, but they are found for the position representation and momentum representation of a system's wave function. Quoting Ao Yang, quote, are there predicates such that we can definitely say of a quantum system, it is such and so? Yes, the wave function is one. The wave function of a system is a definite predicate for it in the position representation. It is not the unique predicate. A predicate in the momentum representation does equally well. Quantum properties are none other than what the wave functions and predicates in other representations describe, close quote. I think of this as moving our perspective up a level, looking not at position itself, but at the wave function that gives the probability amplitude psi and probability density psi squared of position. That is where we find definite values governed by the laws of physics. It's appropriate to look at this level for these kinds of quantum systems because of the kind of things that they are. Expecting something else from them would be to expect something from a thing that's not appropriate to expect from the kind of thing that it is. Molecular orbitals. Let's move now to molecules. Molecules are groups of atoms held together by chemical bonds. This makes use of a concept discussed in the last episode that is pertinent to structure generally, that of embedding. Lower level structures get embedded as kinds of modules into higher level structures. The lower level structures remain, but their combinations make possible a huge proliferation of new kinds of structures. As we move from the level of atoms to molecules, the number of possible entities will expand dramatically. There are many more kinds of molecules than there are kinds of atoms. As of 2021, there are 118 different kinds of atoms called elements. That's impressive, but this is minuscule compared to the number of molecules that can be made from combinations and arrangements of these elements. Uh, to give an idea, the chemical abstract service, which assigns a unique CAS registry number to different chemicals, currently has a database of 177 million different chemical substances. These are just the molecules that we've found or made. There are many more that will be made and could be made. Electrons are again key players in the formation of molecules as well. The behavior of electrons, their location, probability, densities, and wave-like behavior continues to be defined by mathematical wave functions and abide by the Schrodinger equation. A wave function, psi, gives a probability amplitude and its square modulus, psi squared, gives the probability of finding an electron in a given region. So many of the same principles apply. 
But the nature of these functions at the molecular level is more complex. In molecules, the wave functions take new orbital forms. Orbitals in molecules take two new important forms, hybridized orbitals and molecular orbitals. Hybridized orbitals are combinations of regular atomic orbitals that combine to form hybrids. So where before we had regular S-type and P-type orbitals, these can combine to form hybrids such as sp3, sp2, and sp orbitals. With a carbon atom, for instance, in the formation of various organic molecules, the orbitals of the valence electrons will hybridize. Molecular orbitals are the wave functions for electrons in the chemical bonds between the atoms that make up a molecule. Molecular orbitals are formed by combining atomic orbitals or hybrid atomic orbitals from the atoms in the molecule. The wave functions for molecular orbitals don't have analytic solutions to the Schrodinger equations, so they are calculated approximately. A methane molecule is a good example to look at. A methane molecule consists of five atoms, one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. Its chemical formula is CH4. A carbon atom has six electrons and four valence electrons that are available to participate in chemical bonds. In the case of a methane molecule, these four valence electrons will participate in four bonds with four hydrogen atoms. In its ground state, the four valence electrons occupy one 2s orbital and two 2p orbitals. In order to form four bonds, there need to be four identical orbitals available. So the one 2s orbital and the three 2p orbitals hybridize to form four sp3 hybrid orbitals. An sp3 orbital as a hybrid is kind of a mixture of an s-type and p-type orbital. The dumbbell shape of, an, of a p orbital combines with the spherical shape of an s orbital to form a kind of lopsided dumbbell. It's these hybrid sp3 orbitals that then combine with the 1s orbitals of the hydrogen atoms to form molecular orbitals. In this case, the type of molecular orbitals that form are called sigma bonds. The 2s and 2p orbitals in the carbon atom can also hybridize in other ways to form two or three bonds. For example, a carbon atom can bond with two hydrogen atoms and one other carbon atom. When it does this, the 2s orbital hybridizes with just two of the 2p orbitals to form three sp2 orbitals, which bond with the two hydrogens and the other carbon. The remaining 2p orbital combines with the other carbon atom again to its corresponding 2p orbital. This makes two sets of orbitals combining into two molecular bonds, a sigma bond and what is called a pi bond. When a sigma bond and a pi bond form between atoms, it is called a double bond. Carbon atoms can also form triple bonds in which two sp orbitals are formed from the 2s orbital and the 1 2p orbital. This leaves two 2p orbitals to combine with their counterparts in another carbon atom to form a triple bond composed of one sigma bond and two pi bonds. Single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds all have their own geometrical properties like bond angles and freedom of rotation. This has effects on the properties of the resulting molecule. Functional groups. Sigma bonds, pi bonds, single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds make possible several basic molecular structures called functional groups. Functional groups are specific groupings of atoms within molecules that have their own characteristic properties. What's useful about functional groups is that they occur in larger molecules and contribute to the overall properties of the parent molecule to which they belong. There are functional groups containing just carbon, but also functional groups containing halogens, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, boron, and various metals. Some of the most common functional groups include alkyls, alkenyls, and alkynyls, and phenyls, which contain just carbon, fluoros, chloros, and bromos, which contain halogens, hydroxyls, carbonyls, carboxyls, and ethers, which contain oxygen, carboxamides, and amines, which contain nitrogen, sulfhydrils and sulfides, which contain sulfur, phosphates, which contain phosphorus, and so on. Repeatable units. The last subject I'd like to address with all this is the role of repeatable units in the formation of complex chemical structures. Let's come at this from a different direction, starting at the scale of a complex molecule and work our way down. One of the most complex, sophisticated kinds of molecules is a protein. 
proteins are huge by molecular standards. Cytochrome C, for example, has a molecular weight of about 12,000 Daltons. For comparison, methane, discussed previously, has a molecular weight of 16 Daltons. What we find with such molecules is that they are highly reducible to a limited number of repeatable units. But we could imagine it being otherwise, a macromolecule being irreducible from its overall macrostructure and not having any discernible repeating components. Let's imagine a hyper, hypothetical counterfactual case in which a macromolecule of that size is just a chaotic lump. Imagine going to a landfill and gathering a bunch of trash from a heap with all sorts of stuff in it, gathering it all together, rolling it into a ball and binding it with hundreds of types of unmixed adhesives. Any spatial region or voxel of that lump would have different things in it. You might have some cans and wrappers in one part, computer components in another, shredded office papers in another, etc. We can imagine a macromolecule looking like that, a completely heterogeneous assembly. We could imagine further such a heterogeneous macromolecule being able to perform the kinds of functions that proteins perform. Proteins can, in fact, be functionally redundant. There's more than one way to make a protein that performs a given function. So we might imagine a maximally heterogeneous macromolecule that is able to perform all the functions that actually existing proteins perform. But this kind of maximal heterogeneity is not what we see in proteins. Instead, proteins are composed of just 20 repeatable units, a kind of protein forming alphabet. These are amino acids. All the diversity we see in protein structure and function comes from different arrangements of these 20 amino acids. Why would proteins be limited to such a small number of basic components? The main reason is that proteins have to be put together and before that they have to be encoded. And it's much more tractable to build from and encode a smaller number of basic units, as long as it gives you the structural functionality that you'll need in the final macrostructure. It might be possible in principle to build a macromolecule without such a limited number of repeatable units, but it would never happen. The process to build such a molecule would be intractable. This is an example of a general principle I'd like to highlight that we find in chemistry and in structure generally. And it's related to embedding, but it's a slightly different aspect of it. Complex high level structures are composed by the embedding of lower level structures and the higher level structures make use of a limited number of lower level structures that get embedded repeatedly. In the case of a protein, the protein is the higher level structure. Amino acids are the lower level structures. The structures of the amino acids are embedded into the structure of the protein and the higher level structure of the protein uses only a limited number of lower level amino acid structures. A comparison to writing systems comes to mind here. It's possible to represent spoken words in written form in various ways. For example, we can give each word its own character. That would take a lot of characters, several hundred and into the thousands. And such a writing system takes several years to be able to use with any competence. But it's also possible to limit the number of characters used in a writing system by using the same characters for phonemic properties common to all words, like syllables or phonemes. Many alphabets, for example, only have between 20 and 30 characters. And it's possible to learn to use an alphabet fairly quickly. And here's the key. There's no functional representational loss by using such a limited number of characters. The representational space is the same. It's just represented using a much smaller set of basic components. Biochemists mark out four orders of biomolecular structure, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And this is a perfect illustration of structural embedding. The primary structure of a protein is its amino acid sequence. The primary structure is conceptually linear since there's no branching. So you can spell out a protein's primary structure using an amino acid alphabet, one amino acid after another, like M, G, D, V, E, K, methionine, glycine, aspartic acid, valine, glutamic acid, and lysine. Those are the first six amino acids in the sequence for human cytochrome C. What's interesting about amino acids is that they have different functional groups that give them properties that will contribute to the functionality of the protein. We might think of this as a zeroth level protein structure, though I don't know of anyone calling it that. Every amino acid has a carboxyl group and an amino, an, an amino group. That's the same in all of them, but they each have their own side chain or R group in addition to that. And these can be classified by properties like polarity, charge, and other functional groups they contain. For example, methionine is sulfuric, nonpolar, and neutral. Asparginine is an amide. 
polar and neutral. Phenylalanine is aromatic, nonpolar and neutral. Lysine is basic, polar, and positively charged. These are important properties that contribute to a protein's higher level structure. The secondary structure of a protein consists of three-dimensional local structural elements. The interesting thing about secondary structure is in the context of embedding and repeatable units is that these local structures take common shapes that occur all the time in protein formation. The two most important structural elements are alpha helices and beta sheets. True chemical bonds only occur between the amino acid units of the primary structure, but in the higher level structures, the electrostatic forces arising from differences in charge distribution throughout the primary structure make certain regions of the primary structure attracted to each other. These kinds of attractions are called hydrogen bonds, in which a hydrogen atom bound to a more electronegative atom or group is attracted to another electronegative atom bearing a lone pair of electrons. In the case of amino acids, such hydrogen bonding occurs between the amino hydrogen and carboxyl oxygen atoms in the peptide backbone. In an alpha helix, these hydrogen bonds form in a way that makes the amino acids wrap around in a helical shape. In a beta sheet, strands of amino acids will extend linearly for some length and then turn back onto themselves, with a new strand segment extending backwards and forming hydrogen bonds with the previous strand. These hydrogen bond strands of amino acids then form planar sheet-like structures. What's interesting is that these kinds of secondary structures are very common and get used repeatedly, much like amino acids get used repeatedly in primary structures. Secondary structures like alpha helices and beta sheets, among others, then get embedded in even higher level structures. The tertiary structure of a protein is its full three-dimensional structure that incorporates all the lower level structures. Tertiary structures are often represented using coils for the alpha helix components and thick arrows for the beta sheet components. The way a protein is oriented in three-dimensional space is determined by the properties over, of its lower level structures, all the way down to the functional groups of the amino acids. Recall that the different amino acids can be polar or nonpolar. This is really important because proteins reside in an aqueous environment with highly polar water molecules. Nonpolar groups are said to be hydrophobic because conditions in which the surface area of, of exposure, the contact between nonpolar groups and polar water molecules is minimized, are entropically favored. Because of this, polar and nonpolar molecules will appear to repel each other, a hydrophobic effect. Think of the separation of oil and water as an example. Water is polar and oil is nonpolar. This is the same effect occurring at the scale of individual functional group units in the in the protein. Proteins can fold in such a way as to minimize the surface area of nonpolar functional groups exposed to water molecules. One way this can happen is that nonpolar amino acid sections fold over onto each other so that they interact with each other rather than with water molecules and so that the water molecules can interact with each other rather than with the nonpolar amino acid sections. These same kinds of effects uh, driven by the properties of functional groups were also the ones bringing about the secondary structures of alpha helices and beta sheets. Some proteins also have a quaternary structure in which multiple folded protein unit, subunits come together to form a uh, multi-subunit uh, complex. Hemoglobin is an example of this. Hemoglobin is made up of four subunits, two alpha subunits and two uh, beta subunits. There's a pattern here of structure building upon structure, but it does so with a limited set of repeatable stu uh, structures. I'd like to address this again. Why should proteins be built out of only 20 amino acid building blocks? Certainly there could be, at least in theory, a macromolecule that has similar functionality and global structure using the same functional group properties and get it to fold and form in the needed way without the use of repeatable lower level structural units but that's not what we see. Why? One important reason is that proteins need to be encoded. Proteins are made from genes. Genes are a section of DNA that get translated into RNA and then transcribed into proteins. That's a gene's primary function to encode proteins. Uh, DNA and RNA have further simplified components, only four types of nucleotides in each, guanine, adenine, cytosine, and thymine in DNA, and guanine, adenine, cytosine, and uracil in RNA. 
these nucleotides have to match up with the proteins that they encode. And it's going to be very difficult to do that without dividing up the proteins into units that can be encoded in a systematic way. There's a complex biochemical process bringing about the process of transcribing an RNA nucleotide sequence into a protein. But since these are at bottom uh, automatic chemical processes, they have to proceed in systematic repeatable, repeatable ways. An entire macromolecule can't have an entire intracellular biochemical system dedicated to just that macromolecule alone. For one thing, there are too many proteins for that. The same biochemical machinery for transcription has to be able to make any protein. So all proteins have to be made up of the same basic units. The way this works in transcription is that molecules called transfer RNA, tRNA, are dedicated to specific combinations of the four basic RNA nucleotides. These combinations are called codons. A codon in some, is some combination of three nucleotides. So there are four kinds of nucleotides and each codon has three. There are four to the third or 64 possible combinations. Different codons correspond to different amino acids. Since there are only 20 amino acids, there is obviously some redundancy, also called degeneracy, which isn't meant to be insulting, by the way. The way that codons get transcribed into an amino acid is that the tRNA molecules that match the nucleotide sequences of the various codons in the RNA also convey their encoded amino acids. These tRNA molecules come together at the point of transcription, called ribosomes, and link the amino acids together into the chains that form the primary structure of the protein. This is just a part of the bio biochemical machinery of the process. What's important to note here is that although there are a number of tRNA types, it's, it's not unmanageable. There are at most 64 possible codon sequences, so there doesn't have to be a unique set of transcription machinery dedicated to each and every kind of protein. That, that would be insane. The components only have to be dedicated to codon sequences and amino acids, which are much more manageable. Key takeaways. I'd like to summarize the foregoing with four key takeaways uh, from this analysis of structure in chemistry that I think apply to a general philosophy of structure. One, structure can be modeled using functions. Recall that a function is a relation between sets that associate an element in one set or a combination of elements from multiple sets to exactly one element in another set. The source sets are called domains, and the target sets they map onto are called codomains. One example of a function we've looked at in both the previous episode on music and in this episode on chemistry is the waveform function. In chemistry, mathematical functions called orbitals assign to each point in space, the domain, an amplitude value, the codomain. Two, functions occupy only a small portion of a phase space. Functions by nature impose limitations. A relation that associates an element in a domain to more than one element in a codomain would not be a function. A function associates the domain element to only one codomain element. In this way, functions are very orderly. To give an example, in an orbital, a given point in space, a domain element, can have only one amplitude value, the codomain element. This is highly limited. To illustrate this, imagine a phase space of all possible combinations of domain and codomain values. Or to give it a simpler comparison, imagine a linear function on an xy plane. For example, the function y equals x. Uh, this is a straight line at a 45 degree angle to the x and y axes. The straight line is the function, but the phase space is the entire plane. The plane contains all possible combinations of x and y values, but the function is restricted to only those points where y equals x. A similar principle applies to orbitals. The corresponding phase space would be not a plane, but a, a four-dimensional hyperspace with axes r, theta, phi, and psi. The phase space in, is the entire hyperspace. But the wave function, or orbital, is restricted to a three-dimensional space in this four-dimensional hyperspace. This kind of uh, restriction of functions to small portions of phase spaces is a characteristic feature of structure generally. Three, structural embedding. Embedding is a feature of structure that came up in music and has come up again in even more obvious form in chemistry. 
just looking at proteins, the different orders of structure is quite obvious and well known to biochemists with their conceptual divisions of uh, proteins into primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary protein structures with each level of structure incorporating the lower level structures embedded into them. Using proteins as, and as an example, even primary structures have embedded into them several layers of additional structures, such as uh, functional groups, molecular orbitals, atomic orbitals, and the general structure of the wave function itself. One key feature of such embedding is that properties and functionality of the lower level structures are taken up and integrated into the higher level structures into which they are embedded. We saw, for example, how the three-dimensional tertiary structures of a protein takes the form that it does because of the properties of functional groups in the side chains of individual amino acids, in particular, polarity and nonpolarity. Four, repeatable units. A final key takeaway is the use of repeatable units in the process of structural embedding. In retrospect, this is certainly something that is applicable to music as well. Uh, we see repeatable units in the form of pitches and notes. In chemistry, we see repeatable units in macromolecules like polymers and proteins. Polymers like polyethylene, PVC, ABS, polyester, etc. certainly use repeatable units. In some cases, a single repeating unit or sometimes two or three. Uh, proteins make use of more repeatable units, but even there, they make use of a limited number, 20 amino acids. We see here an important general principle of structure, that high level structures tend to be composed through the repeated use of a limited number of lower level structures, rather than by forming as a single bulk, irreducible macrostructure. The use of lower level repeatable units in the higher level structure facilitates the encoding and construction of higher level structures. And that wraps up this study of structure in chemistry. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.